Hey, Sharks fans, thanks for tuning in to another cast from Teal Town, USA. In this interview, we talk with Drew Remenda about transitioning from color to intermission analyst, what's going on with the Edmonton Oilers, thoughts on the San Jose Sharks, fun interviewing Daryl Sutter, behind the scenes of the infamous Ray Ratto Just Win the Game segment, and more. Let's get into it. I mean, how's the transition been for you going to only doing the, you know, color on the, on those, uh, Saturday games and how you've, uh, enjoyed doing the intermissions and whatnot. I really like doing the intermissions. I've loved, I actually really liked it a lot because it, it lets me uh, work to my strengths, which is trying to teach the game, trying to break down the game and get more time between the periods to be able to do that. And color, you know, we talked about last time we talked to AJ, the color nowadays, it's you're reduced to about 15 seconds of, basically providing flowery language for a highlight a shot on goal a chance on net um, i hit or something like that but in doing the panel i get to watch the game from up high again find some things that are that are really interesting to talk about for example you know what the owners changed their penalty kill so last game i was on the panel we broke down the areas where the penalty kill had changed when we did a game earlier in the year i, I had talked to the defenseman about trent yanni and what Trent has brought that's changed things. And Trent and I talked and had a lot of information about that. So you get about, you know, five or six minutes to talk longer and more in depth about this kind of stuff that I really find interesting, which is, again, trying to teach the game, trying to provide some insight into some areas maybe that we're not going to see uh, during the broadcast because you just don't have time anymore in the broadcast. So I had a lot of fun doing that. That, that part has been great. Uh, doing the color is, is doing the color. It's, it's, it's a little bit more fun now doing the color because I shouldn't, I'm not, I'm not it might, this isn't going to sound right, but I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> I don't, I don't care anymore about what people think about it. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I've been for, for four years in, in Edmonton, I've been worried about, you know, what my bosses are thinking, what the orders are thinking. Now I'm going to screw it. I'm, I'm just going to call the game as I see it and, and try to provide, still, still be upbeat and positive, but try to provide what I believe to be, honest commentary mm-hmm. where, where you're not restricted. And you know, I talked, we talked about that the last couple of times that the teams are, are asking their, their color commentators and their broadcasters to do a little bit more cheerleading. And I didn't bring my pom-poms this year. <laughs> well, I mean, the Oilers have just one win in their last seven games, lost the Yep. Goal lead twice to Calgary, gave up five unanswered after giving up, or having the lead twice in Vegas last night. So are the Oilers fans blaming you, DeBrusque, for this, or what's the problem? <laughs> <laughs> right now they're blaming. Right now they're blaming. Uh, they're not shooting messenger yet. Um, they are. They are looking at obviously Peter Shirelli and some of the moves he made. They're blaming Todd um, and they're blaming uh, Cam Talbot um, and the defense. It, it, really, when you look at the Oilers, not a lot has changed from last year, where they finished with 78 points. They they added a few players. They added Nico Koskinen, who at the time, $2.5 million for a backup, as we all looked at. We thought Peter Schnelli was really nutty on that one. Well, but that's proved to be a pretty pretty good move. Yeah, but then why are they blaming Talbot, since Koskinen's gotten the most of the starts so far over the last 10 games? Because Koskinen's... Cause because Cam hasn't won in I think five games now, and his save percentage is eight eight eight, and he's uh, he is the, the labeled number one, mm-hmm. and he has not been able to provide. And even he said it yesterday after the game against Vegas, that he has not been able to provide the big save when the teams needed it. He said I, I gave some big saves, but by the time the game was already out of hand, so they're they're looking around the other thing. Peter Shirelli came out last week in uh, in on the radio in Edmonton and basically declared what well, he did say that is he doesn't have a good, very good group of puck moving defense. He said, that, he said he doesn't think that they move the puck extremely well. He's right. Um, but I might, I might have kept that up to myself. The, the other thing is when you look at the others, Alex chase has been a nice addiction addition. Uh, he came in a, a PTO, been really good. Connor McDavid has been brilliant. Leon dry is now back up with Connor McDavid because Todd just went, well, what the hell? Might as well. Might, like, look at Boston, look at Colorado, load up your top line and see what happens. And they've, they've, it's worked for them to get points, 
but not to get wins. So there's there's not again a lot of depth from the top three forwards down. After that, after the top three forwards, there's there's very little as far as production is going. But when you look at it, I think if you look at the way the others are playing, you can't give up five goals. You can't give up four goals. Trent Yanni said it to me in Europe. He said this to me. Until this team learns to win one nothing games, it's going to be a struggle. And that's how that team has to play. They've got to learn to win one nothing and 2-1 games. Forget trying to outscore your mistakes. You don't have enough offensive power in order to do that. So, learn to win the one nothing, 2-1 games, 3-2 games. They did that the year they finished 103 points. They were able to win those close games because they didn't, once they made a mistake, they didn't make the same mistake again or let down. Right now, they're making the mistake and then they're making it again. And, and that just can't happen. Yeah. And I, I would imagine that, you know, T-Mac and the staff does have to be on the hot seat, 20 games in, barely yep. playing 500 hockey, McDavid, Dreisaitl, and Nugent Hopkins carrying all the, all the water for the team. And sometimes, though, head coaches are the easy scapegoat. But when do you think it is on the coaches? I think it's on the coaches when you see a decided lack of effort from – your top player to your, to your last player. And, and, you know, AJ, you've been around hockey a long time. So have I, you you can tell, you can tell when it, when a team isn't giving effort, when they're going through the motions, when they're in their comfort zone, the whole game. And I, I don't see that with Todd C. And, and, you know, there's a, there's a, uh, there's all this talk now in, 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 in Edmonton because, you know, Todd is on the hot seat that, uh, he, they, the players are shutting him out. The players are, he's lost the room. He's a, first off, nobody knows that except the people in the room. Mm-hmm. You can throw that guess out all you want. And, and, you know, I'm around that team, like many of the other broadcasters and media, a lot. We are privy to a lot of private conversations. From we hear what coaches say, we hear what the players say. You know, we get to have a, a lot of insight. But even we don't know what the hell is going on in that room. Because we're not in that room. So when anybody, like Mark Savard last night, the former NHL player, tweeted out something about about time, Edmonton do the deed or something like that. Um, Let this coach go already because the players have tuned them out. How the hell would Mark Savard know? Well, He has no idea, and he should know better. Did, did, did he get a hold of, uh, I don't know, some footage from an Uber car that Dreisaitl made? No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Maybe people are talking to Uber still and still taking them. So even when I look at, when I look at um, what this team is doing, there are certain things from, from, um, from coaching point of view that you, you could look at and say, well, this, this needs to change. But Todd has taken those steps. The power play, they've, they've changed and it has improved. The penalty kill still struggles. And that says something to say about your, your, your system, but it also has more to say about your goaltender. And then you look at, and your defense. And then you look at some of the ways that, that Todd handles lines. People argue with that. And I, and I'm, I'm one of those guys that thinks that players want to work it out themselves. They want to have certain guys on their lines, and when they're out there and the things don't go well in the first period, they don't want the coach juggling lines. But if you look across the National Hockey League, and you know, I'm watching three games tonight, and you see coaches juggle lines instantaneously. I asked Daryl Sutter once, when do you know? He said, first shift. I said, pardon me? He said, first shift. First shift, I know whether I got the right lines going or not. I said, wow. But that's, that's, you know, that's what coaching, the coaching acumen, coaching experience, playing experience, that, that kind of helps you, but I think most players would like to let the, want the coach to be a little bit more patient. But coaches can't afford to be patient anymore because their job's on the line. And you know, Todd, there's a lot of talk right now at Edmonton after the last, after as you said, one win in the last seven, three and seven in the last ten. Um, there's a lot of talk about Todd and will he last till the end of the month? I have to say that was probably the most enthusiastic Daryl Sutter impression I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> I was telling the story. I was telling my son the story today because we were talking about coaches and everything else. Um, and just, you know, Ron Wilson going into Edmonton when he was coaching the Sharks and saying that, I don't think a Canadian team could ever win the cup again through the media. 
just to get under the skin of the media. I mean, blame the media because of all the pressure. And and I probably talked about Daryl, and Daryl had some legendary things. And Daryl once looked at me when I asked him a question in the media scrum, looked at me and went, you just don't bleep and get it, do you, Drew? And I went, pardon, pardon me, Daryl? I thought it was a pretty innocuous question. But you just don't get it. But my funniest Daryl Southern one was when I, when I was with San Jose, and uh, I did about four games on NBC, four in a row. It was, but it, they were all LA games: LA versus Colorado, LA versus Minnesota. And the last game I did was LA versus San Jose in San Jose. Randy's upstairs, I'm downstairs. I then too. So you know that downstairs guy's got to interview the coaches, right? Mm-hmm. But so the, the first break is Todd. The second break is Daryl. So I go second period and I, I go out and that's the day that Drew Doughty, that was the game Drew Doughty got hurt in the first period. So I get over there and Daryl looks at me and Daryl's, I love Daryl. And, he, and he's been nothing but kind to me and my family and my, my, my boys, especially <laughs> Daryl looks at me and I can tell he's just seen enough of me because I did like four games of his in the eight days, eight, nine days. So he's, he's had it with me. <laughs> so I get up and he looks at me and he goes, are you, are you kidding me? And I went, sorry, sorry, big D. And he goes, what? Okay, let's go. Where? And I said, over there. Let's put him to the camera. It was fine. Go. So I said, Daryl, Drew Dowdy out for, and hasn't come back. Who gets all those minutes? Who eats up those minutes? He looks at me and goes, five guys. Excuse me? <laughs> and he goes, five guys. There were six. Now there's five. Five guys. And that's and, the and way it was. Matt, <laughs> Matt, Green, Matt Green's in front of me. So, and he's, I, can, I look down and Matt Green is dying. <laughs> laughing and i look at daryl and he knew daryl stone face right <laughs> so i'm trying hard as i can not to burst out laughing because i know he's ticked at it so I, I but i gotta ask another question so i said i said to him in the first period i'm you know, inside the bench daryl i'm listening to you you're talking to your guys about pace 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 how do you like your team's pace it's fine okay thanks big d you're the best and i give him a pat in the ass <laughs> i walk over Oh and I jump, you know, because I in in, that, in San Jose, you got to go on back on the side, go on the ice, and I jump over the shark side, and I'm laughing like tears in my eyes, laughing. And Larry Robinson looks at me and goes, "What?" And I said, "Watch the tape." And so he goes. They go in. The coaches go in between the periods. And they, the San Jose Sharks coaches and Brett Heinrich, the great video guy now with uh, video coach now with Colorado. He's got it already queued up for him because he's <laughs> dying. He's howling. And, and they play the tape. So as the coaches are coming out for the third period, I'm standing by there, and each one looks at me and goes, five guys. <laughs> five guys. <laughs> he may have invented the burger chain. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Dwayne Sutter saw me a couple games later. Dwayne's, you know, Daryl's brother on the road, and he grabs me around the back of the neck, which all the Sutter men do. They grab right in the back of the neck, and he goes, that was the funniest <laughs> interview I've ever seen. <laughs> that is great. Still to this day, five guys. Five guys. There were six, now there's five. <laughs> <laughs> Can't hit the nail any harder than that. <laughs> no, no. Like, how stupid was I? <laughs> oh, man. Well, sp- uh, you talk about that game being in San Jose. Of course, we have to talk about the Sharks at this point. The quarter yeah. pole. A lot of great stories so far, whether it's Burns leading the team in points despite the addition of Eric Carlson, uh, Hurdle, Couture, and Pavelski just bang up job but that line of hurdle couture and meyer i think have shocked a lot of people yeah. uh, pavelski playing like i don't know maybe like a, a new contract is in his future uh, <laughs> <laughs> thornton on the third line sliding in and i don't know if it's just me but Sorensen just seems to shine oh, with joe thornton but then again oh. you know thornton has made guys like mark smith and nils ekman shine so you know, right? <laughs> but half the team yeah, already. Well, that's what he does. Yeah, half the team in double digits already. I mean, what have you really seen from this team so far over the first twenty? Well, I see a team that's still not even close to scratching the surface about how good they can be. The one thing I think it's hard for Peter DeBoer when you've got a really talented group of veteran players, and Barry Trotz told me this a year ago. Yeah, it's hard to get them to care about the regular season, right? Mm-hmm. It's hard to get them to, to step on the gas for 82 straight. It just It's just not going to happen, especially when they're a veteran group who have done that, who won the President's Trophy and then dropped out in the first round. 
Yeah. This is a team that is is not even close yet to showing everybody how good they are because they are that good. First off, let's talk about Logan Couture, and I know people in San Jose might roll their eyes when I start doing this because throughout my career in San Jose and in Edmonton, I have marveled about how great of a player this kid is. He He is... There's other guys out there who have more skill, but hockey IQ, anticipation, smarts, I don't know if there's many that can match Logan Couture. Plus, he's game. Man, he is game. When, he, when, when it's time to play, the kid comes to play. He doesn't take nights off. That's what I love about Logan. He's, he's just an honest, friggin' hockey player who every time he gets the opportunity, he is going to give it what he's got. And, and, and he's got a lot. His smarts and skills and, and all that that we just talked about. Um, you mentioned Sorensen. I like him. Well, and, and you said, you know, Joe Thornton does that. Joe Thornton is one of those rare players who makes other people better that are around him. You know, Bill Zachman, Jonathan Chichu, Mark Smith. You, you can name, you can go back to when he played in, in Boston and the guys that he played with that he, he made better. And that's just a testament to how great of a passer he is and how smart of a player he is. Joe Pavelski is Joe Pavelski. You know, they, you look at Joe Pavelski and <laughs> best Joe Pavelski seventh rounder to play the game. <laughs> uh, yeah, without a doubt. But here's what Joe Pavelski has. And this, this is not my line. This is, this is um, Jay Woodcross. He has championship habits. Now, people may not know this, and I'll go back. And if I fudge the story a little bit, it's not on purpose. But from my recollection is, after Joe's rookie year, he goes in and sits with Ron Wilson on the exit interviews. And Ron Wilson says to him, Joe, you're my 13th guy. You're my 13th forward. And, and if you don't start improving in your game in these areas, and he gave me areas, then you're not going to be long for the NHL. And a lot of guys would take that and be hurt and be ticked off and be mad about that. What did Joe Pavelski do? Went, okay. And then he worked on it. And Joe Pavelski, every single day I was in San Jose, every single day, come out early and start and work on his shot. He'd come out early and, and, and work on deflections. He'd stand and stay late in practice. And is there anybody better in standing in front of that and knocking down pucks than that guy? And he kept working and working. He, then, then Todd and Jay Woodcroft and, the, and that group got there. And Jay started going out with, with Joe Pavelski. And they kept working and working and working. Then all of a sudden, Patty Marlowe would go, huh, maybe I should go out there too. And then Joe Thornton would go out there. Then Logan Couture would go out there. And it became Jay's shooting club. All because Joe Pavelski was the guy who wanted to work on his craft and improve his game every single day he could. He is what I call a self-made superstar. And he's the guy that has, as Jay Woodcraft said, and I love the term, championship habits. That's why Pavelski is Pavelski. That's why he comes up in the big moments, because like a golfer, and he's an excellent one, he's worked on it 10,000 times. And I think it's Bruce, Bruce Lee is my childhood hero. And Bruce Lee said once, I don't fear the man who's practiced 10,000 kicks one time. I fear the man who's practiced one kick 10,000 times. That's Joe Pavelski. The one thing I did take away from that is Joe Thornton was yeah. in a shooting club? <laughs> yes, yes. He came out. Yeah, I know. He never does it. But you know what? I always, I always go back, uh, and people may, not, people may not remember, but and I would used to complain on the air all the time. Joe, shoot that puck, shoot that puck, shoot that puck. Vancouver, game four, bang, shot the puck. Patty Marlowe put in the rebound. Saw him after the game, and he looked at me first, and he said, well, see, Drew, shot the puck. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. I know. <laughs> Again, let's go, if you go back to that team now, and then you talk about Brady Carlson. Carlson hasn't even come close to being Eric Carlson. But that's expected. You come to a new area, um, and you – you get used to your team. He'll kick it into gear. You don't have anything to worry about there because he is Eric Cross. He's one of the best defensemen on the planet. Brent Burns, no surprise. Um, he struggled last year early, but he's not struggling now. I would say the one thing that I'm concerned is not the right word, but interested in is, is looking at uh, Martin Jones. <laughs> okay. And, okay. you know, 
now just wait a minute. Eyes on your own paper, yeah. because I have a list of things I wanted to talk to you about, and you've literally gone into exactly what I was about to ask was, what, what's been okay. the bigger surprise for you, Carlson or Martin Jones? <laughs> and Mar you just, you just, Martin Jones. And you just, I was going to say, because you just talked about Cam Talbot, and yeah. it's been a little bit of the same thing with Martin Jones, the big saves when you need it. And I don't know that Martin Jones has had that so far this season, and Dell continues to impress. He does, which is fantastic for, for San Jose that Dell's playing that well. What's what's Jones' save percentage? 884 right now? Yeah. 84, 85, something like that. But a uh, game against, uh, what game was it? Uh, he made that save on, was it Nashville? Save yeah, on oh, two and one? yeah, the Nashville was amazing. Was it Nashville? Yeah, it was the, but the Toronto but game was. was horrible. Yeah. Right, yeah. He, he makes that save on the two on one, and then the Sharks come back and win that game. Pavelski ties it up and Joe scores next in 17 seconds. And that, that phase shows you what Martin Jones can do. There's the big save, but he wasn't very good against Toronto, but the team wasn't very good against Toronto. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I'm looking at that going, okay, I understand that Peter wants to give Marty Martin Jones all the um, time in the world to, to get his game together. Um, you, you've got, uh, you've got great coaches there. You've got, um, um, Ted Berg is, is coaching the He's a smart guy and don't work with him. He'll get it back. I think he'll get it back because he's talented enough to do it, but you don't have to be overly concerned about it because Aaron Dell there is there, but also that's a great thing for Martin Jones to be pushed. You need competition within your lineup. You need to have guys pushing each other. Um, when Glenn Sater was coaching the Oilers when they were winning all those cups, he used to bring guys in all the time and he used to call it the, you got to light the fire from below. Because you gotta you gotta make it percolate and get the tough guys get a little hot under their rear end, so they go. And so Aaron Dell being able to play as well as he has, and I think he has played well, and I think he's a very talented goaltender. I think he can push Martin Jones to get his game back. I think Jones will get his game back. I think he'll get up, but you have gotta have a goalie who's in, who's in anywhere from nine seventeen to nine twenty in that save percentage range to make sure you're a winning team and. and you got to make sure that your your number one guy is your number one guy. But if he's not, Aaron Dell can take it over. I think Aaron's talented enough to be able to do that. Yeah, funny you mention that because he's right now at nine twenty. So yeah, um, yeah, nine twenty is that magic number, boy. You get a guy with the nine twenty save percentage, you're winning a lot of hockey games. Well, I'm going to ask you to put your coach's hat on again, once again. <laughs> Wait, he, the coaches, the coach who was part of the coaching staff that lost 100 games quicker than anybody in history in the National Hockey League. You know, you're the sure. only, you're the only one who mentions that, but okay. <laughs> hey, that's like, I got that going for me, which is nice. <laughs> you know, Thornton was out, you know, he, he went out at the second game versus L.A., was out for a nine-game stretch. And yeah. during that stretch, the Sharks were playing some great hockey. They took points in six straight. The power play was starting to do really well. They were getting a ton of goals from within 10 feet of the crease and the lines at that point that were really clicking was Kirtle with or Couture with Hurdle and Meyer, Suomela with Donskoy and Sorensen, Pavelski with Kane and LeBanc. And when Jumbo returned, DeBoer made changes on every line in order to yeah. bring Thornton in. Now, we debated that on a show at the time that would you know if you were wearing that head coach hat and I was one of the guys that said you know I think I would have left the Couture line alone I would have left the Suomela line alone maybe you slot Thornton in with Kane and uh, Pavelski and you put LeBanc down on the fourth line or because it's Thornton you're bringing him back second knee surgery maybe you leave all three lines alone and you slot him in on the fourth and maybe you spark something from Melker Carlson and Goodrow but you protect his his time on ice while his knees are getting back into shape i'm just wondering how you would have handled that well uh for me handling it would be a little different because uh, as you know I'm president of Joe Clinton fan club so i probably would have put him on the first line and said you want to play about 20 22 minutes today <laughs> But, but to me, um, here's the thing that from even from a broadcaster point of view or uh, an educated fan like yourself and media like yourself being able to watch the game, we watch the game as closely as we can. But coaches see things differently than we do. And coaches see things because they watch video over and over again. 
They watch individuals over and over again. They might have an idea of who works better with, with a guy here or there in certain situations more than we do, more than we know. So when I, when I, and I don't want to be a cop out in saying this, but I would probably acquiesce to Peter's thought process on this because they are more informed and have more insight about where guys slot in. The one thing, though, that you have to balance if you're Peter is you bring Joe back in. Joe comes back in, and we all know what Joe is. Joe's a huge personality, and he's a huge influence in the room, and he's, a, he's he can help your team when he's totally, fully engaged and feeling good. So as a coach, i got to give him that opportunity. i got to give him that opportunity to get right back in it, to be fully engaged, to be that big, bold, positive personality in the room, and that only comes by me giving him the opportunity on the ice. So there's a couple of different things at play. One, what does it do for my team as far as skill on the ice and skill together and chemistry on the ice, but also what does it do to my team in the room if I don't give Joe that opportunity? Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, so that, I think that's you have to take more into account. I, I you know, as as media and as fans, we can look back and go, what's he doing? Just leave those guys the same and put Joe there and, and, and everything's going to be cool. <laughs> but coaches have to take more into consideration than just um, putting, slotting a guy in with, with somebody else and popping some guy out. And especially when you've got a Hall of Fame player and a guy who is a big commanding presence in and on, on and off the ice. Yeah, just, I mean, come on, just win the game. No, I'm kidding. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rick. <laughs> Still not win this. <laughs> you, you want to know the story about that one? Absolutely. The story about that one is, is you know, we're listening, you know, and we've got a, we're, we're waiting to come on camera and Ray and Brett and and uh, Brody are back in the studio, and Ray's going off. And that game was against Arizona, and the Sharks had played extremely well. Outchanced Arizona. Um, they outchanced them 16 to 2 in the, in the first period. I remember that game like it was yesterday. And they outplayed them, but they just couldn't put the puck in the net. And then Ray doing Ray. And I love, I, I love Ray Ratto. Ray Ratto is one of my favorite people in the world. So Ray is going off. And in my ear, Frank Alvin is our producer, and he can see me getting mad. Like he's looking at me, you know, on the monitor down the truck, and he sees me seething. I am getting pissed. I'm getting pissed off because I'm thinking to myself, "What freaking game are you watching?" <laughs> and I'm getting, I'm getting mad. And and this is, this is, by the way, this is for anybody out there who never thought that I ever stuck up for the show. <laughs> so, so Frank Alvin in my ear goes, "Go after him." And I looked at Randy and I went. I just pointed to myself and went, give it to me. Right away, give it to me. And the problem is, if you go back and listen to that, I make no sense whatsoever. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm so mad at Ray. <laughs> but I, I think, I, you know, I think all I can say was, I, was, I sounded like uh, a Jim Moore, a playoffs. <laughs> and then, win the game, win the game. What do you think you're trying to do, Ray? What do you think you're trying to just instead of being smart and going and being calm, I should have said, Ray, they outchanced them sixteen and two in the first period. They had total chances and I should have done all that stuff. Instead, no, I, I was so mad at Ray. And after uh, I get on the bus and we're and we're driving my phone rings. And it's Ray. <laughs> and this is this is and this is this is typical Ray Ratto. He gets how you doing, sweetheart? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I'm fine, dear. How are you? And I said, hey, man, I'm sorry. And he goes, what are you sorry about? That was fantastic. Don't worry about it. That was super. And he goes, that's fun stuff. And then the next year, like game one in Vancouver, Ray and Brad Hedda coming back in the studio again, and the Sharks play a really good game against Vancouver and win the game, and Ray called it a... Uh, uh, ski mask job because he thought that the Sharks stole the game. <laughs> and Randy looks at me and goes, calm down. Man. Uh-uh, let's go. <laughs> and I start off that conversation with this. Uh, listen, I don't want to get an argument over here, but <laughs> and then I yelled at him, Brett, I couldn't get 
Oh man, I miss those days. You know, because yeah, because even fun days. Oh, they were so Go fun. Ahead. And and Ratto, he you know he I, he might sub in. It, you know, it's Curtis Brown's gig. Occasionally, you see yeah. Kyle McLaren. Uh, you might see uh, someone else pop in. Even Devin Setaguchi, I know, did a shot this oh, season. Oh, Devin there? That's great. I love Devin. Good man, boy. Good for him. Yeah. So they they you've seen, uh, but you and then also Ross McKeon has gotten in. So oh yeah, yeah. But I think Rattle- oh, Ray's Ray, man. Ray's Ray, Ray, Ray is Ray. I mean, I used to have, it was, and it was always the same thing after. Hey, sweetheart. Uh, hello, dear. How are you? I just, he just, he never, ever took stuff personally. He knew it was all for entertainment. He knows it's all for, for the fans enjoy a good debate back and forth. And, uh, nothing but love and admiration and respect for Ray Rado. That's awesome. Are you ready? <laughs> I mean, you, you might have, you might have the trademark on this. You might have invented it, but are you ready for a quick quiz? Sure. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, if you can only pick one area of improvement for the Sharks to focus on, what would it be? Penalty killing. Penalty killing? They're second in the league. I know. Keep it there. Oh, man. Keep it there. Man. Penalty killing is a goalie. Oh, man. Drew. Drew schooling me again. Hey, you know what? Nah, you know what? Changing that. I'm, going, I'm changing that. Goaltending. We just talked about goaltending. All right. Uh, chances Carlson resigns in San Jose, and I don't mean Melker. Uh... Ninety-eight point nine percent. Ooh, uh, bigger weakest link right now. Martin Jones or the product of a subpar defense in front of him. Martin Jones. You I did playing the goal. <laughs> you did voiceover work for NHL Two K Nine and Ten. Do you still have those games? And if so, do you ever play them? Uh, never played them. My kids played them uh, once just to hear my voice, and they told me that Dad, the other game's better, which I didn't know what the other game was. <laughs> um, last video game I played, I think, was Miss Pac-Man. Nice. More surprising, Vancouver starting hot or L.A.'s implosion? L.A.'s implosion. Shocked at that. But I shouldn't be. You know, they're, they're, not very, they're not very fast, and maybe that's the issue. But L.A.'s implosion. Yeah. Did you think Ilya Kovalchuk would have more of an impact? No. No, I honestly didn't. I thought that was a risky signing, and the KHL or the, the NHL is very different from the KHL. So, no, I didn't think he, I didn't think he was going to be um, the big star coming back that he was when he left. Uh, tougher SOB of a player, Chloe or Nolan? Oh. <laughs> oh, I stumped him, everybody. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh. Uh, oh, Owen. But, but oh, that's a hard one. Owen, but I recommend anybody go back and watch Ryan Clone. Ryan Clone opened the old Roman Polak door. Remember that story? Yes. Yes. Well, and yeah. let's be honest yeah. too. Owen Nolan has yet to get an assist from being on the other side of the bench. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's a it's a once boy. That's a tough one. That's that's a good one. Like I'm gonna go with uh, I'm gonna go with O. All right. Uh, better accent, Urbe or Nabby? Archers. Archers. Jo- All right. Uh, Joe Thornton. Rec- like Wall. Yes, like Wall. Joe Thornton recently played his 1500th NHL game, scored his 400th goal. Do you have a favorite story of Thornton that you can share with us? I've got a lot with Joe. I'll give you, I'll give you this one because this shows you the type of person Joe Thornton is. Uh, a friend of mine uh, has got a team that is playing in a tournament and they are playing in a, a, a t- on a team, kids playing on a team, and they are trying to raise some money. So they asked me to get a Joe Thornton jersey signed. So I get, go get the jersey, and I walk up to Jumbo, and I say, hey, and can you do this for me? Which, which he always did. He goes, yeah, no problem. Who's this for? Uh, I said, I'm selling it on eBay. <laughs> he goes, yeah, right. <laughs> and I said, no, it's their so-and-so. They're, they're trying to raise some money, and, and this is what uh, this is, they want to auction this off. And he goes, how much money do you think they'll get for it? I said, well, I don't know, probably about, hopefully about, they're hoping for about $1,000. He goes, oh. Signs the jersey, goes, hold on. Walks away comes back, hands me $1,000, said, give this to him for me. Wow. That's Joe Thornton. That's amazing. So, yeah, that's Joe Thornton. All right. So, fi- fi- that's, 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 my, that's, one of my, that's my favorite story about Joe. I know that wasn't necessarily a quick quiz, but the final question, no. and, and these are authentic questions, by the way, that I pulled from Twitter, from Reddit, when we put it out that we were going to just be, be speaking with you, and the final All one... Right. The last one was, 
Do you miss us as much as we miss you? <laughs> I miss you more. <laughs> and that is the honest to goodness truth. And I got to be uh, absolutely honest. Uh, when I looked at the schedule, and I'm going, okay, Remenda is only doing color on Saturdays, so he'll travel with the team on those. And uh, I went right to the schedule and said, okay, when does Edmonton play in San Jose on Saturday? Oh, crap. And they put, and it's the only team we play five times this season, none of them in San Jose on a yeah. Saturday. Come on. No, I do I do the game uh, when, they come to, uh, when they come to Edmonton. Um, I've had many of my friends from the Sharks uh, office call them and say, are you in this trip? And they're like, you know, my friends from, uh, from NBC Sports. And uh, no, and uh, it's going to be not hard to watch tomorrow because I, I always watch the Sharks. It's, I'll miss you. But I'll, I'll miss you guys and not seeing you guys. I probably won't be in San Jose at all this year. So. <sighs> well, and who, uh, boy, I want to say, who was, who's the uh, gentleman? Oh, my Lord. Over the last broadcast, Versus St. Louis. Who who's the guy? Uh Tarasenko. So Tarasenko, he was talking about Tarasenko and Ovechkin. So we're like the only guys that they don't have water inside the bottles. They've got Pepsi. Yeah. And, yeah. and well, then, I thought Ovechkin I thought Ovechkin was I thought Ovechkin was was the other cola. I, I'm not sure. But, but, not. I mean, they, but it's the Pepsi and NHL drink, so but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well it was and so of course the the obvious joke was, uh, you know, Tarasenko, uh, you know, he's there's that huge tooth that's missing up front. And it's, well, he, and Randy, of course, makes the joke of, well, maybe that's why, you know, that tooth is missing, all that Pepsi. And, of course, I had to get on, on Twitter and ask, and ask Randy, <laughs> well, you, if, if that's what it is, maybe that's why uh, Remenda became follically challenged is the too much Pepsi. I, I wish, but I'll tell you what. <laughs> Dr. Bob Bonahum, who was our very first dentist with the San Jose Sharks and did the 49ers, and he's still my dentist. He's the only guy I go see. He's driving a new Mercedes because of my teeth. So, you know what? Probably be on to something there. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, thanks so much again for joining us. We hope to uh, talk to you again soon, maybe at the halfway mark. Maybe we talk a little bit. Are you going to be in town at least for the All-Star festivities? No, they don't care. They don't send a part timer like me around to those big, big deal things now. No, no, no. They send the big dogs for that. Oh. No, that's two All Star games. The two times the All Star has been in, in San Jose are the two ones I missed. I missed all the good stuff in San Jose. <laughs> no, I can't. I can't say that. I've been around for some pretty damn good games, some pretty damn good years. So that's not true. But I've, I've outdoor game and the two All Star games, not around. Oh, man. oh well. well. First world problems, babe. First world problems. I'm okay. Thanks again for joining us. We will talk to you soon. Okay, Jay. You take care, pal.